The military are monsters in uniform. Picture this scene. You're a happy autocrat, ruling your people with the benevolence and wisdom that only the anointed possess. You've ordered your subjects' lives in the manner that is best for them. They're not always happy, but they don't always know what's good for them, or they would be happy. It's not easy being an autocrat. Sometimes you have to crack the whip. Sometimes it's necessary to throw your people into some camps, break up their families, or eradicate the occasional village here or there. This is the price of order. Whether you're progressing towards socialism, communism, fascism, Islamism, or that special Latin American dictatorship you can call your very own. It's the power of the state, of your state, that makes everything possible. Then one day your whole world is turned upside down. You've done something to anger the great United States of America. To your surprise, suddenly there are American soldiers everywhere. They're destroying your statues. They're liberating your people. And ungrateful as they are, your people are joining the Americans in hunting you down and bringing you to justice. As you, the formerly great despot of Durka Durkistan, are dragged out of your spider hole, you realize your destiny has been sealed by the young men and women wearing the uniform of the United States of America. That's... <laughs> the liberal vision, one of centralized control, state domination, and the suppression of individual liberty in the name of progress is often the same as that of many of the autocrats our military has crushed over the years. C.S. Lewis once remarked that the most oppressive of tyrannies is a tyranny that is exercised for the good of its victims. And this describes the project of liberalism to the T. Liberalism is the contention that all governance and policy ought to be judged not by its outcomes or its means, but by its intentions. That's the core ethic of the liberal. It gives us the, the key to the real reasons the liberal hate the military. The first is the U.S. military's long-standing record of smashing the liberal project on every continent in every era. When Americans destroyed German militarism in World War I, liberals understood that we crushed a particular model of centralized, aggressive state control that they themselves aspired to. When the Americans again crushed the Axis in World War II, liberals knew that with those powers died a vision of centralist, corporatist, hierarchical governance that they not so secretly revered. And when the American military, under the despised Ronald Reagan, laid to rest once and for all the hope of communism, liberals were once again deprived of a model of totalitarian control for which they had much sympathy. The liberal who's trained at Berkeley or Brown or Williams no doubt has a meltdown at the thought of a confident, aggressive, victorious American failing to respect the multiculturalist ideas that provide the basis for their whole world view. Where the liberal espouses the false equality of cultures, the American soldier demonstrates with the rifle and the MRE the intrinsic superiority of ours. Where the liberal pays lip service to the validity of all mores and beliefs, the American soldier embarks upon missions every day to forcibly eliminate tyranny. And where the liberal subscribes to a creed of American impotence and our ability to, inability rather to change the world, the American soldier demonstrates that American power changes the world for the better every single day. Peace, <laughs> peace through superior firepower is a credo the American soldier lives by. Give peace a chance is, well, a really crappy song by a guy <laughs> who also imagined no heaven and no countries. The American soldier could never imagine living in that world. And that's another thing about liberals. They don't even like American soldiers. They don't like who they are and where they come from. I mean, how do I say this? Listen to the way liberals talk about our soldiers. During the Iraq war, liberals were constantly saying things like, well, we're for the soldier. We're just against his mission. That's like being for McDonald's and against the beef. <laughs> that's like being for football players but against the coaches and the team. That's like being for freedom but against democracy or being for the people who work at corporations, but against corporations themse themselves. Oh, I forgot. And that's what liberals really think about those things, too. Telling a soldier you're for him but against his mission may make the liberal feel a little better, but not the soldier who's risking his very life for the mission. But liberals don't like our soldiers for other reasons. For one, a disproportionate number of our troops come from the South. They believe in God. They love guns and football and NASCAR and love their country so much that they decided to fight for her and maybe die for her. Liberals see it a little bit differently. They see soldiers as being victims of economic circumstances that compel them to join. They see the military as an outpost for uneducated bumpkins and inner city kids who join the military because they have no other options, they say. Now, I'd love to see a liberal actually say any of this to a soldier's face. Don't hold your breath. They know that the uh, concerned, smug look on their face might be wiped off with one smack. When the liberals' favorite soldier, John Kerry, returned from his four-month summer vacation in Vietnam, cameras in tow, 
He flew straight to Washington, D.C., threw the medals he didn't earn into the Potomac, and testified before a bunch of senators that the guys he was fighting with were a bunch of monsters and animals. Liberals ate it all up, and the liberal media especially. This ambitious Yale man, Kerry, was chairman of the Liberal Party of the Yale Political Union. He was trotted before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a committee he would later chair, to tell sto the, his story about his service in Vietnam. And wow, what stories he told. Not even his stories, but stories by a group called the Winter Soldiers Project. Stories Kerry didn't bother to fact check. Why bother when they fit your agenda perfectly? That the stories were largely proven to be pure fabrications didn't stop John Kerry or prompt even an apology. They told the stories of times that they had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads, taped wires from portable telephones to human genitals and turned up the power, cut off limbs, blown up bodies, randomly shot at civilians, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Unbelievable. He spoke in his weird, affected, masterpiece theater accent. And you know, when you listen to his description, it sounds like an average week for Saddam Hussein and his sons when they ruled Iraq. But Kerry was describing the American soldier. He was happy to smear all GIs and do so with that dour, haughty pomposity we've come to know and dislike Kerry for, and do all to advance his own standing in his own political career. Here's how he described his fellow soldiers. Quote, the country doesn't know it yet, but it's created a monster, a monster in the form of millions of men who have been taught to deal and to trade in violence and who were given the chance to die for the biggest nothing in history, he said. Now, the liberals really ate that up. And John Kerry, a warrior for the liberal cause, kept on feeding them more and more. When asked about why he thought our soldiers, the so-called monsters he described, did what they did in Vietnam, John Kerry went straight for the cultural jugular. I think clearly the responsibility for what has happened there lies elsewhere. I think it lies in large part with this country, which allows a young child before he reaches the age of 14 to see 12,000 violent deaths on television, which glorifies the John Wayne syndrome, which uh, puts out uh, fighting man comic books on the stands. John Wayne syndrome? I didn't know liking John Wayne was a disease, Senator Blue Blood. <laughs> Kerry didn't blame the soldiers for being monsters. They just couldn't help themselves. It's the country they grew up in, in those John Wayne movies, and those comic books that turn those, those poor guys into monsters. That's what liberals really think about our soldiers and the country they serve. And then there's one last reason liberals really despise the military. His name is George S. Patton and all that he epitomized. I love... I love just running through some of his most famous quotations. It gives every liberal a migraine. He said, a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. Liberals hate that one because they're always in search of perfection. He said, if everyone is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. Liberals hate that patent gem because they seek conformity. And then there's this Patton classic. Battle is the most magnificent competition in which a human being can indulge. It brings out all that is best. It removes all that is base. All men are afraid in battle, he said. The coward is the one who lets his fear overcome his sense of duty. Duty is the essence of manhood, he said. Battle, competition, winners, losers, duty to country, manhood. That's why liberals hate the U.S. military. Because our soldiers believe in all of that stuff crazy old Patton believed in. And they're willing to pay the ultimate price for those beliefs. <laughs>